This episode, all eyes are on harvest. And we take a close look at whether fruit's ready to harvest or not. So we're talking about picking decisions. We're talking about the factors that might affect those. What's the first thing that would come to your mind? Sugar ripeness. Sweetness. We go through and we'll just sample the fruit, right? I think there's the, the romantic idea of a winemaker walking through a vineyard block, sampling berry after berry, but in actual fact, that's really not how it's done at all. Typically, you're going through and it's a little bit more methodical because how berries ripen is gonna differ throughout a vineyard block. And so you're gonna to wanna to try to capture as representative a sample as possible. But I think very, very rarely, if ever, would you come across a block that's completely uniform ripeness. You know, vineyards are often planted on hills, so you're gonna have different ripeness from top to bottom. If a vineyard's planted east to west, you know, you'll have different ripeness levels on either side of the canopy. So sides that see sunlight all day versus sides that don't. Sugar ripeness is critical because that's our potential alcohol. And when we're thinking of wine, we're looking for something that has a little bit of weight in body, and that's what alcohol gives us. So typically, but depending on the wine that we're trying to produce, we're looking for some minimum sugar ripeness. And sugar is an interesting thing because if you think about regulatory bodies, they'll often base their quality level of grapes just off of sugar. Right. That's why Bordeaux Superior has a little bit more potential alcohol, 0.5% more, with the idea that those are riper and therefore better grapes. But that's not necessarily the case. Sugar is just one piece in a much larger puzzle. It's exactly. not like we're harvesting table grapes. You go to the grocery store, you get a bag of grapes. What are you looking for? Well, you're looking for a nice pop of sweetness. And obviously we need that sweetness for wine. We need that alcohol to give us weight, to give us body. but there's so much more. That kind of leads us to factor two, acids. Another major component in the composition of grape juice, it's going to lend itself to wines and stylistic interpretations of how wines might be made. But generally when you take a grape sample, you're looking at sugar, you're looking at acids, you're looking at pH, you're looking at total acidity or tri titratable acidity. Uh, some places might break it down and look at the specific composition of acids and the breakdown between tartaric, namely, and malic acid. And there's some other trace ones, but those are the two major ones that will help inform decisions for winemaking down the road. We're in the post veraison period, and that's when the malic acid begins to degrade, and you're left with tartaric acid as the prominent acid in the composition of a berry. And that's important because malic acid, think of that really crunchy acidity that you get when you bite into a green apple, into a Granny Smith apple. It's quite tart and bracing, yeah. so we're looking for that to soften, and that's going to influence our picking decision. And so you have an increasing trend where people are so-called picking based on acidity. And so there's a lot of different considerations, and some will trump others, depending on your winemaking philosophy, the wine style that you're after, other commercial considerations. And so if you're picking on acidity, it's like, okay, we're trying to retain freshness. We're picking at higher acid levels with lower pHs. Some wine styles, like sparkling wine, you're just inherently doing that. But I think there is that movement towards fresher wines, and you see people picking based on acidity more frequently too. And then this will also tie it into factor number three phenolic ripeness or physiological ripeness. Aroma and flavor, arguably one of the most important factors. Yeah, because you can have sugar, you can have acid, but if it doesn't taste good, at the end of the day, you're not gonna pick it. We're here to get drunk and we're here to hopefully taste something. High sugar oftentimes gives us riper flavors, darker berry fruit in the case of something like Pinot Noir, like we're standing in or standing behind. We're in front of it, actually. But that's not necessarily the case. There's not a perfect relationship between sugar ripeness and flavor development. No, a great example was when I was working in South Africa, there was this block of Merlot, and you think, oh, South, a South Africa, lots of heat, should be able to ripen pretty much anything they want. And this particular block of Merlot was set like 28 bricks, and it just tasted like vegetables. <laughs> So you can have that kind of counterintuitive, really boozy wine that still tastes unripe. Yeah, and, and that just speaks to the variety and the placement in the region or on the specific farm. And so it's not always just like, there's heat there, 
we can ripen whatever we want. So we're looking for ripe flavors, and obviously ripe can be quite subjective. For some winemakers, it could be looking for more red berry fruits. For others, it could be more dark berry fruit. When you pick is gonna influence what that flavor profile looks like. Absolutely. But it's also gonna be largely dependent on perhaps the style that you're looking to create or the region in which you're growing. Because if we think about places like Champagne, where they're picking, they've got phenolic ripeness, physiological ripeness, and good flavor development, but it's ripening at a point where there's low sugar, high acid, and it's just lending itself to a great base wine. And we're trying to avoid unripe flavors as well. So those kind of green, really pungent bell pepper aromas, those are what we're trying to avoid. Ideally, I think trying to keep some of that green herbaceous character for varieties like Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, where we're not letting them hang so long that you end up with dead fruits because the grape will literally resonate on the vine and you end up with stewed fruit aromas that are kind of muddled, nondescript, not very interesting, and just boozy and don't have the potential to age. Those wines will probably prematurely age actually. And then it's a struggle once it comes into the winery because now you're working with potential alcohol of 16 or more that's going to require specific yeast to be able to do that. And you've probably got incredibly low acid at that point. So now you're talking about supplementing the acid instead of what's coming in naturally. But along with the uh, physiological ripeness comes tannin. That's another factor. Factor number four. So much like flavor, tannin will develop itself. And so you can come through when fruit is considered unripe and you'll have these astringent tannin that's kind of disjointed. And there's two sources of tannin in a grape berry. The skin, that's the more desirable tannin, which is gonna give us kind of a silkier, more velvety tannin profile potentially. And you have the seed tannin. Seed tannin, much harsher, more astringent. That's not really desirable. So with skin tannin, there's a bit of a misnomer that the longer you hang the fruit, the softer, the skin tannins get over time. And the more brown the seeds get, the more lignified the seeds are. And so those are less harsh as a result. In actual fact, that's not exactly how it works. The level of skin tannin doesn't change in the berry itself. The tannin does feel softer as you let it hang. It's less green, it's less astringent, but that's because of anthocyanin content in the berry. What's anthocyanin? The red color. What does color have anything to do with the tannin profile in a berry? Well, they're closely linked. I mean, first of all, they're both phenols, which seems counterintuitive. Obviously, anthocyanin, we visualize it exactly. in terms of the color of the berry and the resulting wine. Tannins, we feel that, we feel that on our palate when we're eating a berry, when we're drinking a glass of wine. But they're closely linked because what happens is anthocyanin binds with skin tannin, and that process is what, through polymerization, softens the perception of the tannin. Nothing with the tannins changing at all is purely our perception. perception. So when a winemaker goes through a vineyard and says, oh, this berry, I can tell this block's not ready. The tannins are still green and astringent. I mean, technically that's true. Perception-wise, it's astringent, but the tannins themselves aren't green. Nothing's changing with the tannins. It's purely that polymerization with anthocyanin. And that's where it becomes a little bit difficult because obviously once you go through Veraison and you see the dark color of the berries, you can't tell that the anthocyanin content, that the color intensity is increasing. So you can actually use very sophisticated phenolic analyses yeah. to do that for you. And what winemakers have found, especially in regions like Napa that are taking hold of this new technology, is that they can pick earlier than they thought they could. That the tannins are actually more developed than they were. And that's because the polymerization with anthocyanin is just beginning in the vineyard. This is the start of the process. Yeah. And so it's gonna continue through the winemaking process. And so it's really difficult to do something that's purely visual. Taste is just a very small part of it. 
So that was long and dull for probably a lot of people out there. But all these factors are, you know, going to inform a decision. But once a decision is made, now we got to talk about logistics. How are we getting this done? Because it's great to walk through a vineyard, taste a grape, and be like, pick it. It could be a 50 acre block, it could be a 100 acre block. So logistically, are we hand picking? Are we machine harvesting? There's a lot of cogs that go into this process. And it basically comes down to what kind of manpower do you have? In years like this, with a global pandemic and limited travel, there is a great decrease in labor. And so hand harvesting is quite difficult at the moment. And the other consideration is we need room in the winery. Absolutely. Not every business is perfectly designed where they have their vineyard that's allocated to their varieties of the exact amount they want to produce for an individual skew, and they can pick it in a day, process it in a day, and it's in the winery. I don't know if that's ever been the case. And so you're often stuck with these vineyards that have been developed by a third party or something like that, that you're sourcing fruit from, and you have to work that into your schedule because you could be producing everything from sparkling wine all the way to late ripening red like Nebbiolo, and you have got this massive amount of logistics to consider when things come in, how long it takes to prep them before fermentation, where they go for fermentation, how long they spend fermenting. There's a lot that goes into just that individual decision outside of saying these grapes are ready to pick. And that's going to tie in closely with number six, which is the weather. The weather. It's probably the most important consideration because nobody ain't going to pick in the rain. I mean, you, you can, but it's ill-advised because any drop of moisture on the fruit is going to get into the wine and dilute it. The other thing that we're cognizant of is extreme weather events. If we see we're going to have five days of rain in a row, well, maybe the fruit's not quite where we want it to be, but we're going to pick it because we're more confident that at least we know what we have at this point versus six days from now after torrential downpours. We don't know what shape the fruit's going to be in. Is there going to be rot? Is there going to be mildew? Is it going to be dilute? Is it going to be washed out? Will it's we the, have a vineyard still? <laughs> it's the tricky thing with grapes, like wine grapes specifically, because they're largely not meant to be where they're planted all over the globe. And so there's a lot of things you need to do to mitigate them from rotting on the vine. If you're looking at a five day weather forecast and it's rain, 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 then the vines can suck up this rain and the berries can expand to the point where they actually burst and then mildews and stuff like that get in and it all turns to mold and nobody wants that. Just so, think water and fruit in your home. It's not a winning combination, nor is it in the vineyard when they're at this point of the growing season. You've spent your whole year working on tending to the vines. You don't want to lose it because some rain is in the forecast. And it's not just rain when we're talking about extreme weather events. It could be heat waves as well. When we're at this point of the growing season, a heat wave can be detrimental. It can be detrimental because berries are potentially vulnerable to sunburn. It can also be detrimental because it can lead to extreme dehydration. Again, yeah. going back to the idea of raisinated fruits. And that was an impact in vintages like 2017 in Napa and Sonoma, where it was looking like an above average vintage, but they had a very poorly timed heat wave right during harvest. And people who picked before the heat wave, they came out ahead, even though the fruit probably wasn't where they wanted it to be because the heat wave had that much of an impact. Frost, fall frost, you know, a frost comes through and nukes the canopy all of a sudden you've got no means of ripening the fruit any further. We saw that in 2020 here in the Okanagan when we had a record snowfall in mid-October that more or less quickly signified <laughs> the end of the growing season. So you had a real rush of people trying to get as much fruit into the winery as they could before that. You can let it hang and kind of slowly desiccate or dry up on the vine, but you're not improving any flavor. There's no flavor development there. Maybe concentrating sugars the acid's not going to change. So if you've got the space in the winery, it's best to just get it in. In the last factor, factor number seven, were we in the right order? The last factor is the law. The law. So the classic example would be in Champagne, where the region dictates when wineries are allowed to start their harvest. 
That's for historical quality reasons. You didn't want people jumping the gun before the fruit was ready. Closer to home, the example would be ice wine. Exactly, where you need a minimum temperature, minus eight for picking and processing, 35 degree bricks, 40 degree bricks, super concentrated sugars. And if you don't make that mark, then you're looking at a special select late harvest or late harvest or things of that nature. And so we spent all this time talking about these factors that could inform your decision. But at the end of the day, you've got all these things happening in the back of your mind. But if you're walking down a row, you're tasting the fruit and it tastes good, you can pick it. Or you may have missed the window because a lot of people would argue if it tastes good, should have picked it two weeks ago. That's an inflammatory statement. Cheers guys, thanks for watching.